please, you can start. Yeah. Do you see everything? Yes, it's okay. Okay, good. So, um, today I wanted to discuss a few topics that are quite controversial, like what is that they caused the previous crypto hype. And therefore, uh, there are a lot of misunderstandings of what certain things can do or cannot do, or stuff like that. And uh, this basically lecture will be kind of an introductory one. It's not super formal. So we will use a lot of just real world examples in order to grasp the concepts and later on, guys will share more technical details in the following lectures. Okay, just a quick slide about me. If you haven't seen me uh, yet, so yeah, I'm a cryptographer and co founder of Distributed Lab. Yeah, I think that's enough. Um, okay, uh, I gave the lecture about tokenization. This was lecture number two. And um, the, basically, I want to remind that like token is just something that like that represents an ownership of a certain asset. So uh, token is kind of similar to a word thing. So this is a thing, this is a thing, and like this is the thing. So in the digital world, uh, we use the word token. It's not some magical. Uh, representative of some new asset class, but rather like a pointer, if you're familiar with C++. Yeah. So NFT, um, basically NFT is a non-fungible token um, that is um, pointed to representing ownership of a certain asset. It could be a digital asset or it could be the um, pointer to a physical asset, but recorded digitally. And uh, since it's a unique uh, thing, then they're not exchangeable one-to-one -to, -one to any other things. So for example, this, like on the picture, we see the quite famous like, crypto punks, and the, there are 10,000 of them. They're all different. And therefore, the prices for them will be also different, even though from the computer point of view is just another picture and people like some more some less and uh, some pictures are owned by more famous people and some by not less famous people and therefore they have different price so that's basically it the nft is just a token that represents ownership of a certain non-fungible asset and um, I can comment on why NFTs became uh, very popular in 2021, 2022, uh, actually 2021. And uh, there are a few reasons. That was the, the easiest way for non-crypto people, even corporations to enter blockchain world. They didn't need to, so to say, deal with security tokens, uh, they didn't need to deal with blockchain, actually. They were basically buying digital art. And uh, people bet on the fact that digital art, especially the very um, first one, will be very popular in the future, will be used in games, in metaverses, and things like that. And therefore, like an ancient artifacts that become really expensive, like pieces of like Bible, let's say, uh, will become very um, um, kind of very expensive. Uh, so they bought these people uh, bought NFTs uh, in order they expected profits later when they can resell them to following investors or collectors. And also they were like a uh, hidden trend, uh, which used NFTs as the tax evasion tool. So basically people were buying, you know, uh, NFTs pretending they bought them for a lot of money. And then, yeah, 
was it transferring money with this tool or just claiming that they lost a lot of money so on reducing their tax base so yeah the nfts uh, like maybe 30 percent of according to rumors 30 percent of trading volume was connected to the uh, yeah tax evasion so such an interesting thing um and yeah obviously digital artists were like crazy about this idea uh before that they had to use like centralized platforms there was no transparent process of selling digital art and now like the super modern tool is available and everybody was kind of super excited about that so nfts be became like really popular quite fast but their popularity is also faded uh, quite fast and some people even claim it's total like bullshit and that nfts are useless I would not agree to this because NFT is just again the ownership right for some asset. The technology doesn't care. Yeah. So there were like a few like standards, uh, so to say, on Ethereum that described these non-fungible tokens. But guys, we'll talk about that later. So there you can, yeah, you can split ownership of NFT to pieces and yeah, resell it piece by piece. Um, I also showed this example from lecture two. So if you imagine that game, uh, you can again see the slides from lecture two. Um, the, all the digital objects, in-game objects are effectively NFTs. So there's, there's no magic here. Just if you implement it in the right way, you will build some kind of NFT like technology. So um, basically NFTs, will be everywhere uh, maybe people will not use the, the name as is right now but the technology will be similar so software licenses will be an nft way like the game objects digital art books domain names like some reputation etc so it all will be transformed tokenized and put on some blockchain or blockchains um, why they are needed? Uh, literally, there is no other way to build uh, and secure ownership of digital like objects in decentralized environment. So, the other way of implementing NFT, uh, so to say, is to have a centralized entity that keeps track of all ownership right, rights and uh, yeah, just manages these transactions. But yeah, if you want to build it in a decentralized environment, you need some kind of this tool. Okay, uh, smart contract. Um, the smart contract is also has a term has a lot of conspiracy uh, behind it. Uh, people, some people claim that oh it will transform the financial industry overnight it will eliminate all the notaries all the you know like middlemen I and mean, that's not fully true um, so basically smart contract is just a piece of code uh, and this piece of code uh, is uh, kind of executed on top of a decentralized system which means that multiple parties multiple like validators execute the same code and then they run consensus basically about the result of execution so um, you can execute a smart contract on a single machine uh, in that case there will be just no consensus so it means that your computer can make an error um, or do it not correctly and therefore yeah you want for the security you want multiple parties to um yeah to execute it even yeah, i'm pretty sure whoever is somehow connected to it industry has heard the um like operational memory called ecc error correction yeah so which means that the traditional like chip ram is can have errors uh, that somehow appear by chance and ecc memory is kind of correcting the errors so smart contract has similar idea it's uh, making sure that the whatever logic is embedded into into it 
will be verified by multiple parties and the result will be like kind of um, agreed together. And basically the goal of smart contracts is to manage certain ownership rights. So basically in blockchain, almost everything is ownership right. So all the tokens, um, yeah, all the data is owned by some account address and therefore uh, smart contract logic needs to change yeah who owns what after the result and sometimes they call like d apps uh, so yeah the visual representation of what we just discussed so the code executed yeah literally or right now it obviously it's not processed on smartphones but in the future i'm pretty sure some blockchains will will, will be run on phones as well and there it should be a similar the same result. Uh, the typical, like the simplest example of a smart contract is a, like say delivery delivery contract when you have a buyer, uh, buyer and seller and you have a mediator. And uh, if for some reason, yeah, transaction is not going through. So the delivery is not doing something, doing something wrong or seller, sold the wrong product then the mediator will uh, kind of release the money to whoever yeah whoever is right so basically in that case uh, the mediator itself uh, cannot steal the money uh, or any other party cannot steal the money only if they cooperate together then money can be like stolen like buyer plus mediator or seller plus mediator if everything is right, then everything is correct, then mediator is not even needed. So that's the feature of multi-signature. And obviously you can have that's uh, such functionality, you can have multiple mediators and that adds additional like level of security because then more people need to collude together. And uh, these two parties, if they're not happy with the particular mediator, they can change the mediator. It's not uh, possible in a traditional industry. If you're using an escrow agent like a bank, you cannot change it uh, without the risk of, yeah, the bank can steal the, uh, the collateral. So the smart contract in that case implement a very important piece of logic and it will be used really everywhere. So multi-signature will be really popular and it be, it's the foundation of DeFi, which we will talk about later. Um, in that case, again, the picture from lecture two, um, the smart contract distributes profits from the uh, game account to investors. And therefore investors may not rely of, on honesty of the game developer, but rather trust the code. So the companies that, they will, that will use smart contracts to manage themselves, um, or like distribute dividends will be valued higher because there is less risk that something will go wrong. Obviously, there are very few cases right now, uh, very few examples of companies that can be uh, fully tokenized and fully managed by smart contracts, but there will be more and more. And games are just one example. Uh, another kind of important piece of the smart contract ecosystem is an Oracle, uh, nothing complicated. Oracle is just a provider of cryptographically signed data. So in our example on the right, uh, there are like one, two, three, let's see, a few Oracles that uh, provide data about the five, provide data about temperature on a certain territory. So the like space, the zone, the ground, the yeah, whatever, balloon. And uh, if they all agree more or less uh, about the temperature, then the contract is, is executed. In that case, it's just, yeah, a visual representation of the insurance contract. So let's say farmers can sign an insurance contract with the bank, with insurance company, with an auditor, uh, that if temperature drops, below uh, like uh, zero, then 
the farmer needs to get the payback some insurance so but you can have let's say if four out of five oracles agree or three out of five or all need to agree so you, you can see yeah but the data about temperature should be cryptographically signed because if it's not then yeah it's not an oracle it's just uh, an opinion right everybody can become an oracle and there are even networks um like so it's chains that support that aggregate data from oracles store them in a decentralized way and feed them into smart contracts one example is chaining uh, yeah so a lot of innovation will come from this sphere oracles are needed in order for smart contracts to function so smart contracts cannot read uh, data outside of the blockchain directly they need an oracle DAO. Uh, it's decentralized autonomous organization also yeah quite overhyped world word um it means uh, basically the smart contract or collection of smart contracts and uh, they allow to manage a virtual organization and actually in some countries this organization is already considered it as like legal in Wyoming, for example, in the US. And whoever is a stakeholder, they are using cryptographic keys to manage that organization, to vote, to move money, to move other assets or IP within it, et cetera, et cetera. So basically, instead of having an accountant or instead of using Excel spreadsheets or paper, it's all programmed by a smart contract and uh, yeah all the board meetings are you know result of them is recorded in the in the transactions and processed by smart contracts and obviously that's we're talking about the future some stakeholders may not be humans they may be certain smart contracts or just addresses and i i'm pretty sure we will see new like legal entities that are not humans and not uh, traditional like uh, limited liability companies but rather organizations that ha have no human stakeholders so yeah that will be interesting times um deck mm, decentralized exchange it is also a smart contract and it facilitates exchange of tokenized assets uh, without uh, trusting anybody so you know you need to trust the developer of smart contract yeah that's the ultimate truth um, therefore all this what well, usually dex is open source so technically you can verify that there are no issues inside no bugs yeah if you can and audit is done exactly for that reason so um, dex can exchange assets that are issued with on the same blockchain so let's say on ethereum or on polygon something like that and um, cross chain dexes uh yeah still like it's a hard task to build them we'll talk about later um, but yeah when assets are on the same chain then it's more or less easy task now so uniswap is the best example of yeah of these decks and uh, users can launch copies of these dexes to in order to yeah to exchange their own assets so this industry is also kind of is quickly developing um, we see appearance of derivatives on these dexes that also traded so the whole financial industry is recreated using smart contracts that's not a quick process because um, you know traditional financial industry is uh, has developed a lot of instruments um, a lot of like logic that needs to be done uh, like compliance so crypto people now trying to cut some corners and recreate things and some dexes they have their 
you know, tokens. They could be called governance tokens or something else. Effectively, they more look like shares. And I think in the future, it will be, um, yeah, pretty common for a smart contract to be treated like as a company and to have sh like shares and pay dividends or something like that. But currently people try to avoid that in order not to talk too much to SEC in the US. But yeah, I think it's quite logical way of development. So all the like DEXs and DEXs effectively could be DAO. Uh, it may not be a DAO, but I, I'm pretty sure it, most of the DEXs will be DAOs. Um, DeFi. So DeFi is effectively a term for like decentralized finance. And like technically Bitcoin is also a DeFi, it's a decentralized. So we have here like smart contracts, oracles, like taxes, like everything that is facilitating um, exchange of assets, issuance, exchange, derivatives, yeah, whatever usage uh, in a trustless way. Uh, a lot of algorithms are like already implemented. Um, and again, the key feature is this trustless. So you don't need to kind of rely on certain party. Uh, obviously, DeFi became um, kind of pretty lucrative industry for those who cannot enter a traditional financial industry, like people that are under sanctions or people who don't want to pass KYC or like whatever, didn't disclose their wealth. Uh, that's their choice. So DeFi is accommodating all these guys. Plus, um, like who want to stay anonymous, uh, plus the traditional like financial players, they see the value of automation. So the trend of future years will be like regulated DeFi. So traditional like financial industry players, they rely on manpower, rely on paper procedures that are quite you know old, and um, yeah. Optimizing it, automating that, making it work in a secure way, that's a huge innovation. So the scale of magnitude, which will kind of wait for us is like transforming from paper to internet. So com companies like 30 years ago worked perfectly on paper. There was no like databases available for like- uh, I think I'm small and medium companies uh, and now like without internet nobody can you know imagine a business so i'm pretty sure that in 20 years all finance will switch to DeFi, and um, decentralization in that case may have different forms in the simplest form mm, it could be a consortium uh, style decentralization where if i am like a broker investment firm, then I share my ledger with uh, auditors and for example, with government or whoever, or my like, investors. And you can have a fully anonymous blockchain where certain applications will be run to. Uh, there'll be a lot of place for innovation. It'll be, it'll be fun. So yeah, the development of the industry is kind of slowed down by certain kind of factors that depend on the whole nature of blockchain and decentralization. First of all is um, if you have, if you want that trustless execution, you need to understand that code becomes law. Um, so if something is written down and you don't like it, but after you already used it, you cannot really change it. So like uh, maybe some people remember the project was called DDAO, I think 2016, which raised $160 million. Then the hackers discovered vulnerability in the smart contract and they kind of took 
60 million out of it, something like that. And then uh, Vitalik Buterin basically uh, agreed to do a hard fork of Ethereum. And that's how Ethereum Classic appeared. So Ethereum was kind of removing this trace of the transactions where the hackers stole the money and yeah, refunded all the investors. So that's the example of the, uh, yeah, this important question, how to fix bug in a production smart contract, which already manages money. And at the same time, do not give ability to whatever, malicious administrators to do the same, but introducing the bug. So if you have the ability to change the smart contract after it's deployed, then you can introduce bugs uh, later. So how to manage this you know, balance is a good question and there are no answers yet. So you need to trust people anyway, to a certain extent. Then the second thing, which is partially solved through certain like ideas like Taproot um, is how to anonymize, how to hide the conditions of the smart contract. So nobody wants to put all the you know, business conditions and relations onto public blockchain that they were available for competitors. So in ideal world, uh, two parties or three or five need to sign a contract between themselves, but do not disclose the exact you know, code of the contract. But with ability to verify that the code was executed correctly. So like zero knowledge proofs, um, you know, will help here, but you know, this space is quickly, you know, developing. But this is a, these are not an easy problem. The third one is scalability and high cost of transactions. And these are issues quite um, common to decentralized and uh, trustless blockchains. So yeah, I think only high value contracts will be deployed on Ethereum and uh, other block contracts will be deployed on the L2 or some you know, less important blockchains or even consortium blockchains. But yeah, we, we don't have the full answer about how the whole ecosystem will work here. Then there is still an issue how to exchange um, assets that are issued on different blockchains. If these blockchains are, they both support the same technology, the same cryptography, so like forks of Ethereum, for example, then the problem becomes much simpler, but still it's not a instant exchange. So you still have certain risks, but you know, even we developed a solution, we'll announce it later. Uh, but if these uh, blockchains are built using different cryptography, different transaction model, then it's, it becomes a problem. So you need to have a mediator. You need to trust somebody. Um, and yeah, it's pain in the ass. And the last one that is quite universal for the whole blockchain industry is still how to build a wallet that is quite uniform, that is like open to verify that is quite secure, convenient to manage all these interactions. So like MetaMask, for example, allows you to, you know, send transactions and sign certain like piece of data, but managing um, a document, um, managing, you know, random arbitrary piece of data and clauses, uh, you need quite sophisticated software for that. And this software is by no chance is standard yet. So it's all done like imagine, you know, Microsoft DOS. That's the style of how people like are managing that now. So we still have long path before it becomes like mainstream. Yeah, basically that's it uh, for the, uh, yeah, the most important part of these things. I left uh, quite a lot of time for discussions. So if you have questions, then it's time to ask them. And, uh, please. 
Can I have one? Uh, to yeah, please, sure. Uh, could you please explain the use cases about identity management using uh, blockchains? Uh, your identity is effectively a piece of data that uh, you need to have control over, uh, which may have like updatable fields because like people, you know, change, they have more, you know, new credentials, new um, kind of features. Um, so blockchain will store information about this data structure and will uh, make this data structure public. So you, you may have different even personas um, and you can have, you know, zero knowledge proofs that allow you to um, kind of not disclose too much data, but provide the ability to verify that this data is there. So let's say um, like a very lame example, um, you are a client of uh, Booking.com and you, you have a genius level there, but you don't want to share the data about in which hotels you stayed in the past to the hotel that you are checking in now, but they want to see, um, for example, for reservation that you stayed in an expensive hotels. So using cryptography and blockchain, you can create a proof that you whatever stayed in expensive hotels uh, and uh, they didn't have any problem with you. And therefore they will trust you to book something or like book in an expensive car. So things like that. So um, it could be a self-sovereign identity where you put all the clauses and you manage your own identity, or it could be a traditional way of doing identity when there is a identity provider, like a passport, uh, you know, issuance, uh, like government service, and they contain information about you in their own, maybe private blockchain, but give you the proof and give you the receipt that your identity is valid. And uh, they cannot delete it randomly and say, no, we didn't have you in the past. So you will have the proof. So it, there is no clear understanding of how digital identity will work, but it's definitely a huge like industry. We wrote one paper uh, about how the whole ecosystem may work. I think Alex can put in the chat that white paper or share later. Yes, please would be really yeah. good to hear. That's, yeah, that, I think that's one of the next big things. Thank you very much. Any other questions? Hi, uh, if possible, uh, the question about coins database, uh, or which is uh, the database in Bitcoin. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, in fact, where does it reside and who is responsible for its maintenance and uh, protection from hackers? Um, if you're talking about some blockchain or Bitcoin, I mean, the whole like structure of Bitcoin blockchain or any other blockchain prevents uh, like changes, not authorized changes in the database. So if somebody changes something, then first of all, the cryptography will kind of highlight that piece of data. The second is that um, blockchain is stored on multiple computers so the hacker cannot simultaneously change the piece of data on multiple computers that would be like yeah it's considered hard in a truly decentralized system obviously the one uh, the one way of doing some bad things is stealing user's key and initiating transaction on behalf of the user stealing money or doing some other bad things impersonating yeah in the case with identity but that's this problem is not is outside of like scope of what blockchain can can do uh, yeah so the stealing of user keys is, is always an issue so for that you need to use multi-signature yeah, and other tools hardware wallets that's how you can but just changing the database of coins no it's not possible but uh, yeah during the election it was uh it was mentioned that there is a special database 
coins database, which is no. which yeah. stores uh, uh, unspent transactions out. Right. And like, is it uh, something different from the blockchain itself? I mean, uh, um, how they are uh, different? Yeah, you know, blockchain is the logical structure of the data. So blockchain is stored in one database or multiple, yeah, doesn't matter, but it has the data associated with each data record uh, that allows you to verify that certain piece of data is correct and was not changed. So even if you like physically, you know, change bits and bytes in the database, the security check will not, you know, allow it. Uh, so it will be invalid a piece of data. So, but it's not the topic of this lecture, but no, it's, it's not possible to just change it and without notice and on multiple computers. Okay, Pavel, uh, I can shortly answer. So okay. coins database is like database that is format according to all transactions included in the blockchain. And uh, it will be like the same on all validators and all auditors because everybody has the same history. I would say that. But coin database uh, includes only result of performance of previous transactions. Okay, okay. Yep. did Thanks. I answer? Okay, thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks. Okay, if you have more questions about like DeFi, NFTs. Um, maybe, maybe I try to ask you uh, uh, about what do you see the role of um, public administration yeah, in the process of uh, in, uh, in involving yeah, in this process of uh, blockchain uh, in producing, yeah? What should uh, uh, public administration and public institution do uh, on this way? Yeah? Um, it's a very big question. You, you are talking we... about uh, common standards, yeah? Uh, yeah. Common, uh, for example. I think at this moment, um, like, Government should not regulate technology. It's not their role. Uh, like currently, the role of government is regulating the like consumer relationships, uh, like whatever companies versus consumer relationships, the like, kind of financial uh, com compliance to financial, some kind of yeah securities law and other criminal law, et cetera. So this is about like transactions on top. Um, in some cases, obviously government will use blockchain for to build their public registries, to build certain you know, use cases that they need, um, like timestamping, et cetera. But, and they can, like we see it right now, government goes, asks uh, some chain analytics tools to in order to find some criminals. Um, but regulating the technology, I don't think it will, it, like some governments try to regulate technology, but that's like a dead end for them. It's not, it will not happen because technology is technology. So that's a very, very short version of an answer. So obviously the world is really uh, unpredictable. We can see anything uh, like, you know, um, some countries in the past prohibited research of genetics or prohibited research of, of this, of that, and or in West versa invested in certain technology through like government uh, like sponsored tech parks. So yeah, anything can happen. I'm not an expert in, in, in government policies, so yeah, just personal opinion. Right, maybe I'll have another one. Uh, it's um, about uh, chain analysis tools, right? So mm -hmm. um, what's your opinion about this fact that like Vitalik Buterin is proposing to make anonymous transactions more or less? Mm -hmm. And how do you see the business of chain analytics after that? Um, 
in truly anonymous blockchain, yes, you cannot use um, and you cannot deduce transactions 100%, but you can have some statistical tools. Uh, also, I think the business will be more like forensic style. So they will be using data from internet providers. They'll be using data from mobile phones. Yeah, so the business of research, like forensic, will always be there. So even like in Monero, I mean, Monero is not the most sophisticated and anonymizing tool, uh, but Monero, you can guess the probabilities and you can see like with certain um, certainty where the money went. And uh, while controlling points of entering the money or exiting the money, like centralized exchanges and OTC um, kind of desks, you can deduce something. So, I mean, chain analysis will be doing slightly different type of business, uh, but anyway, it will be doing some kind of business. But generally technology will become, uh, the public blockchains at some point will become an anonymous um, because they can. So. Okay, so effectively they need to cooperate with governmental agencies and entities to do like analysis on entry yeah, exit yeah. point. They do it now one way, they will be doing it another way. So yeah. All right, all right, thank you. Uh, I'm pretty sure that at some point and very likely that our chips, the hardware chips are tempered. And that's why like US is trying to move production out of China and don't give them technology because the most efficient way to spy on you is to embed it into hardware. So I'm pretty sure this decentralization will mean also ability to design your own hardware chips in, in, in a, some country, for example, or in a company even, and uh, ability to print the chips and to make devices that you know that you're not tempered with. So owning your own um, you know, plant, that will be a need. All right. Like now Thank only in the printer, mm -hmm. like only in the printer in your in your company. You don't want uh, your like confidential documents to to be sent through public email on some printing office and somebody just reading it from one place. So every company has its own printer or even an old shredder. That's the reality. Okay, thank you. Hi, Pavel. If I could ask a question, uh, yes, it's yes. it's it's very generic, but still, uh, if we take a crystal ball now and look twelve to twenty four months in the future, what, in your opinion, would be the most exciting advancements and developments in blockchain and cryptography? What what would you love to see? Uh... Honestly, I don't have an opinion. I pray to more people understanding that the whole like scope of technology, of decentralized technologies is important and is inevitable to come. And we'll start like starting to learn, starting to experiment with all kinds of things. So the yeah, maybe identity. Identity is the key to many use cases. So maybe identity will become the uh, the next big thing. And um, alongside with that, the some practical like uh, down to earth things like social networking, like messaging that is uh, protected by cryptography. You know, may take certain um, kind of share of the market or even like sales of the domain names, like public auctioning of the domain names. Now it's very you know, opaque uh, industry. So I wait for some signs of some new things, but I do not try to like predict. I try to like listen. Okay, thank you. And uh, sorry, what's the what's the name of your uh, of your paper on uh, uh, on on decentralized identity? I would love to yeah. read that. 
Alex will put it in right now. It's, okay. The name is, yeah, quite funny. <laughs> okay, thank you. Alex, you can put in the chat, I guess, or in. Uh, after our lecture, we will share that in, in our comment chat. So oh, okay. everybody can access that here. Okay. Yes, we will we will post uh, in classroom all uh, links about this topic. Okay, since there is no question uh, from other guys, maybe I can ask one more. <laughs> yes. uh, it's about um, reliability of computations, right? So effectively, decentralized systems, as we are looking here allows you to effectively agree on some computational results not mm -hmm. trusting the individual results from kind of min minority of uh, parties there but this system is kind of slow more or less because of various reasons right mm -hmm. however however there are other areas where this thing is very important like if you have mission critical systems right you have multi cpu environment and you need those cpu to be working reliably and pretty much fast and also agree on computational results right so do you see any uh, kind of movement towards let's call it embedded reliable comp computation that uh, somehow resemble distributed systems that we are talking about? Um, no, I haven't seen this. Um, I would say the it's kind of a little bit different purpose. Like oh, if you it, have oh, it, it's different purpose, but you know the most interesting yeah. interesting stuff happens on on the kind of on the edge of the yeah. world if you have the environment that you fully control so like processors core like cores on, in the same like server then you don't need to run like for like this type of technology consensus etc that you need to have it in a fully decentralized system where you don't control computers so i think it will be different set of technologies so maybe at some point they will converge but I don't think it will be anytime like soon. Uh, there is a demand and um, it, it will grow quite fast. The technologies that allow you to outsource computation to some non-trusted entities. And the this computation should be done in a like in a private way. So the external computer cannot like see the data itself, just can only compute. Uh, like, Morphic encryption. And exactly, like yes. Uh -huh. uh, and that's one thing. And then you need to have a proof that that computer did everything according to the computational algorithm. Uh, and supply this proof together with the result of the computation. Like these things already exist and they are like yeah these startups are being built um then you can treat your the whole internet as your own computer so you trust this you know course you don't need even to run the consensus over the results you need to verify the zero knowledge proof and that's it so yeah it's a, it will be a big advancement and we are like i don't know 10 years from it. Okay, thank you. Okay. Yeah, intentionally made this lecture shorter because I needed to, I need to leave in like five minutes. So, yeah. Thank you for a lot. About question uh, in the chat. 
uh, of course, uh, later on in our next lecture, we will um, separately focus on uh, smart contracts and DeFi, and we will tell you many more interesting things in this context in more detail. Oh, if possible, you should wait a little. So, thank you. Thank you, Pavel. And, thank you. Uh, See you soon. Thanks for the questions. Yeah. If more, please feel free to reach me. Thank you very much. Have a good night. Have a good day. Yeah. Bye. Bye. Thanks. Bye.